Are black voters ditching the Democratic Party? While this group has historically supported Democrats, showing up for Joe Biden back in 2020 in a make or break contest in Georgia that put him in the Oval Office, for example, almost four years later, polls show that black voters are checking out, particularly black men. Now, that's all relative, of course, the overwhelming majority of black men still vote for Democrats. But a recent Reuters Ipsos poll found 18 percent of black Americans would pick Donald Trump over Biden in a hypothetical matchup compared to 46 who favored Biden. Uh, which could dramatically impact the outcome of an election in which every vote counts. However, it doesn't seem that Democratic Party leaders are taking these warnings especially seriously. Congressional Black Caucus PAC Chair Rep Gregory Meeks said of the upcoming election, quote, let's be serious. Black folks know there are two choices in this election. Moreover, according to the Democratic establishment and the mainstream media, the rise of insurgent third-party candidates like Cornell West are an added obstacle. Here's what White House reporters for Bloomberg, Akela Gardner, said on MSNBC. Let's watch. People are just frankly not running and jumping about another term of President Biden, and they're frankly keeping their options open. Certainly strategists have raised concerns about third party candidates, not just Cornell West, but also the snow labels candidates that we're hearing about. But I think the thing that the Biden world is banking on is Donald Trump. Their hope is that if he is, in fact, the nominee, that will galvanize people in the same way that it did in 2020. There was voters who purely cast a vote against Donald Trump, and they're hoping that threats to democracy and him being on the ballot again will have the same effect that it did then. Is Trump enough to scare people to the polls? According to Reuters, quote, many advisors to Biden downplay the threat that Cornell West holds in pulling away black voters, pointing to Biden's record in appointing both the first black female vice president and Supreme Court justice. Seems like they're doing everything that kind of irks you, uh, to, to put it mildly, in terms of just assuming and taking for granted um, the votes of black people or thinking they can mollify black voters by doing the most um, surface level outreach, by which I mean, oh yeah, we have a black vice president, so we're good, right? It's even worse. There's a news story in Politico that is talking about some of these anxieties from about third party uh, candidacies. And um, uh, apparently, there's a belief, this is a quote from the article, there is also a belief among CBC Congressional Black Caucus members that the drive to elect the first black speaker, minority leader Hakeem Jeffries, would be a motivator for black voters too. How many Americans can name yeah. who the minority leader is? Right. And to be clear, not specifically black Americans, just Anybody. all Americans. <laughs> and, and it would take me three and, seconds. I won't, I won't get the, I'll get the name, but you know what I mean? And if you know who Hakeem Jeffries is, you're presuming that people like him. He's someone who spent the last few years of his career raising money in super PACs, explicitly targeting progressives that are Democrats, particularly progressives of color like Elon Musk and Ilhan Omar, et cetera, because they support policies in line with rights for Palestinians and don't want unconditional aid to Israel. And he has done more, I think, and been more vocal about his advocacy for the Israel lobby than he ever has for the interest of black Americans. So the idea that we have to protect Hakeem Jeffries, of all people, is laughable beyond even the name recognition point. This is, this, is, this is terrifying to Democrats, because not only is there a third party challenger, there's a black third party challenger. And so much of the rhetoric that has been deployed against the left since 2016 has been, oh, they're Bernie bros. Oh, they're just these white guys living in their parents' basement. Hillary Clinton, who, shocker, is also white, was put on a pedestal in 2016 as somehow the, the voice of black American. S uh, what did they call her? Maya Buela, Sister Hillary. All of these kind of things were meant to polarize the public to believe that the left movement was a white movement. And if you really cared about the interests of people of color, you would vote for the woman whose policies led to open slave markets in Libya. But we're not in 2016 anymore. And moreover, instead of having just a black VP like Jill Stein had in Ajamu Baraka. The head of the ticket is not only a black man, but one of the most famous and well-regarded politically and academically black intellectuals, public intellectuals of any race in the United States of America. Someone who has demonstrated an ability to talk across the aisle, have cordial, productive conversations with people like Candace Owens, um, who treats people and engages with people 
principally with, with principle, but also with a lot of respect, and who could have a broader reach and is di more difficult to condemn as simply a nameless, faceless spoiler to some other people who might throw their hat in the ring. Yeah, I can understand why. Uh, I would understand them being concerned, although it sounds like they're not concerned. They just think they are owed uh, the black vote. And, you know, you can't discount, like, as you point out, the, the number of black voters that Republicans are getting, that, like, Donald Trump is getting, it's, it's very low. But... Every year, every cycle, it's like a little it's less a little low than more. the cycle before it. Uh, yeah. As as um, race is actually becoming somewhat depolarized, as like educational achievement and income level gets more polarized. Um, yeah, it's I very mean, interesting. Historically, black voters commitment to the Democratic Party is because the Democratic Party was protecting our voting rights. And right, substantively, I suppose that's still true. Technically, I mean, not, I mean obviously, for the first. You know, from 19, from 1860s uh, until I think up through was what the Republicans got. You know, the vast, vast, vast majority yeah, of the there black was realignment. Vote. Then there was a realignment when the he, the Demo yeah. you know the the Republican Party made an explicit pivot um, to try to pick right. up Dixie Southern Dixiecrats who were frustrated I think, but by I think integration. Even in, yeah, I think even up and to, pandered up to the, like the kind the of racist segregationist 40s South. and 50s, it was pretty split. Right, but it's been a long time yeah. since then. And so the point is that if Democrats are not being perceived, one, if you don't perceive there to be a significant threat to voting rights, people can subjectively feel how they want to feel about that. And two, if you think that even if there is a real threat, the Democratic Party, one, is either isn't doing much about it, or two, can't do that much about it because the co a composition of the Supreme Court, then are there diminishing returns for voting for Democrats? And also, are black people tired of their entire interests politically being boiled down to voting rights? Mm -hmm. There is a way that the Democratic Party talks to and about black people that feels like our concerns are frozen in 1965. So it's not that those rights and interests aren't important, but why? Do, what is the pitch to black voters? It's, liter know. it's literally, it should have been, it was a little bit in Georgia. Now we know it was a lie and of like a fraudulent inducement to the polls, basically. But you have disproportionate amounts of student debt. We're going to cancel your student debt. We're going to give the $2,000 checks, um, you know, those kinds of things. But didn't come to fruition. And I remember hearing some activists, some, some, uh, some door knockers in Georgia being interviewed, I think actually on Cornell West's old podcast, uh, shortly after uh, Biden won in 2020, saying, we pulled it out for him, I, for Biden. I don't know that we're going to be able to do that again. We wasted, wasted all our political capital. We spent all our political capital getting Biden to win this time. It's not going to work again. And remember what Biden told black voters in 2020. If you are undecided at this juncture, if you're not going to vote for me, you ain't black. Yeah. Look what happens to Ice Cube every time he even suggests that there be an agenda for black Americans that the Democratic Party actually attend to beyond the idea that, oh, we're better than Trump and, oh, voting rights are on the table. Well, 2024 Democratic candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. may have an uphill battle with this key voting bloc. In recent conversations on the Math Hoffa's podcast, he defended why he's against reparations. Let's listen. If there was no other, if there was no other issue, I would be against cash payment reparations. But the word reparation means repair. And, you know, I grew up in a Jim Crow and I saw this was not just, the, the injury did not end with slavery. The injury and the deliberate suppression, the institutionalization of poverty in black neighborhoods is uh, systematic, it's systemic, and it, it, uh, and it continues today in a million different ways. Mm. And we need to rebuild the, the uh, black communities. And, and so that, you know, but my approach to doing that would be to do it in a way that I think is going to be most effective, which is what we did at bed -Stuy. We created what we call a community development corporation there, and it is now the model for hundreds of community development corporations around the country because it works. So he went on for a long time answering that question about reparations, uh, and his answer was no. Like, there was a lot of words that were like, I see you, I understand you. I don't know that I've ever heard RFK Jr. sound more like Hillary Clinton than he did in that response. A lot of kind of platitudes to make it sound like you're saying the right thing. I really understand your concerns. I really understand why you're in this position. I understand the way that you're wrong, but also I'm not gonna do the thing that you wanna do about it. Here's what I think would help in my subjective opinion. And at the end, one of the men in that room really did push back quite effectively 
on RFK Jr.'s position, but here's the bottom line. You cannot believe in reparations. You cannot support reparations, but black people also don't have to vote for you. And that goes for reparations and any other policies that would disproportionately affect the interest of the black community. And there should be no expectation that black people are the ballast for the Democratic Party and the most dependent voter bloc, without which they could never win any election ever, without there being some material returns. And Biden could have started by not sabotaging, I don't know, the $15 minimum wage, which I remember the stat from the Bernie campaign. I don't want to misquote it, but I do believe something incredible, like 33 percent of black Americans would have benefited from a um, minimum wage raise. Hmm. We'll have more rising right after this.